Okay. So, um, oh, sorry, sorry, Ryan, just, just to make sure, can, can you actually see me or can you see the PowerPoint? Both, both. Oh, both? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, as Roya mentioned, uh, my name is William Kirtley, and I'm a partner at the uh, law firm Duguay Kirtley in Paris, uh, which is an arbitration boutique uh, specialized in investment uh, arbitration, uh, international mediation, and um, investment arbitrations along with state-to-state disputes. Um, we also represent uh, non-state actors such as the former British Protectorate of Barassi Land, which is claiming independence from Bolivia. Uh, today I'm going to be focusing on the role of international arbitration and mediation in the cross-border enforcement of intellectual property rights. Um, I will start by briefly examining um, the challenges posed by cross-border enforcement of intellectual property rights. Uh, before examining the advantages of using uh, arbitration to ensure intellectual property uh, on rights, prior to examining the advantages and disadvantages of uh, international mediation as a means of dispute settlement with respect to intellectual property rights. Um, arbitration as a private and confidential procedure is increasingly becoming used to resolve uh, disputes involving intellectual property rights, uh, especially when involving parties from uh, different jurisdictions, so especially for cross-border disputes. Um, intellectual property uh, disputes have a number of particular characteristics that may be better addressed by arbitration before litigation, which I'll be going over. Um, now, one interesting source of disputes um, uh, on which I will not be focusing, since it is too broad for today's webinar, um, and we get us uh, somewhat off track, is uh, concerns laws and regulations put into place by states to deprive IP owners of intellectual property rights. And this actually is the uh, first slide, which uh, I understand that you can see. Um, and this shows uh, the, the growth of investor-state treaty arbitration. Now, uh, this actually is an option for uh, certain investors to use against states with respect to uh, IP rights. Um, and it's a very ripe uh, source for, um, um, for, for just resolving uh, issues involving laws which are negative to IP rights in the future. Uh, um, and it's being used already by companies today. And it has been for the past uh, four or five years. Um, for instance, Philip Morris is suing Australia uh, for infringing its trademarks with respect to uh, cigarettes in terms of plain packaging laws. Um, and Philip Morris is also suing Uruguay. Um, now that's a bit cynical, but uh, there are some other uses of uh, investor state arbitration which, which are um, um, with respect to IP rights. And I, I myself have been involved in at least one uh, investor state uh, arbitration dispute uh, concerning a pharmaceutical product uh, who, where the IP rights, uh, the trademarks and the copyrights uh, with respect to this product were, were violated in an Eastern European company. And we were able to um, uh, seek the redress that the uh, uh, investor um, wanted um, with respect to a law which was uh, discriminatory. Um, but I, I will not be dealing with that, and I will also not be speaking about criminal aspects of the enforcement of property rights, um, such as counterfeiting, uh, which arbitration is not well suited to uh, deal with, because the, uh, that is the um, prerogative of the, the state. So rather, I'll, I'll be focusing my presentation on the more typical civil disputes that can be resolved by international arbitration. Um, now, the World Intellectual Property uh, Organization's Arbitration Center um, is uh, leading uh, the charge with respect to uh, international arbitrations and international mediations, although another, uh, a number of other arbitral institutions are involved, including the ICC and to, uh, here in Paris, and to a lesser extent the um, uh, LCIA, uh, to a significant extent also the uh, AAA for domestic disputes in the U.S. and the ICDR for international disputes involved in the U.S. Um, the uh, ICC today um, 
um, estimates that approximately 10% of uh, approximately 800 annual uh, arbitration disputes uh, involve IP uh, involve an IP element. Um, and as you can see, almost every um, domain name related dispute is resolved via arbitration, uh, which is interesting. And uh, while the uh, WIPO Arbitration Center has only had 100 arbitrations uh, uh, over time, uh, it has had 15,000 uh, domain name uh, disputes. And the numbers uh, continue to increase, uh, I would assume, as the, um, as the, the most choice property is, uh, is bought up and the internet you know, grows and continues to expand. Um, now, domain names are not, in fact, technically speaking, intellectual property rights, although the issues addressed in them, um, uh, such as questions of confusing similarity and good faith, have uh, quite a bit of trademark law about them. Um, I have certain elements, but they, they do overlap, and uh, and WIPO has um, has created a, a very a swift procedure uh, that only takes about two months, um, which is conducted entirely in an online electronic format, uh, delivering enforceable decisions with respect to these trade names. Um, Hopefully, and this is not in place yet, but for more general arbitration procedures, it will be possible to uh, to, uh, to 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 have such uh, swift uh, procedures with respect to uh, typical um, disputes involving trademark, involving patents, etc. We're it's not quite there, but a number of um, I would say entrepreneurs are actually trying to set up online uh, systems to make this possible. Um, when, uh, in terms of the current challenges with respect to the enforcement of cross-border uh, enforcement of intellectual property rights before state courts, now the current system, which is um, which is the traditional system, which goes before state courts, um, does have a number of quite basic issues. Um, and the, I mean, the primary issue is that I, IP rights created by national legislation are territorial in nature, and hence uh, rights created by one country or um, or one regional group cannot be easily enforced in the other. So your patent that was filed in the U.S. has no value in Equatorial Guinea. Now, we've been involved in, in a number of cases there, and I can assure you that it, it has no value. Um, consequently. Redressing infringement of counterpart patents, copyrights, or trademarks in various countries uh, entails litigation in multiple foreign courts with different judicial systems and judges with varying degrees of experience and qualifications. Um, if you've ever been involved in a court proceeding in Belarus, for instance, uh, with respect to intellectual property rights, you might not be impressed by the um, by the, the independence of the judges. And if you've ever uh, been involved in court proceedings in Italy, you might still be waiting for a decision. Um, <laughs> but uh, more, moreover, litigating in multiple jurisdictions is very expensive and time consuming. Um, it also poses the risk of inconsistent results where uh, the courts of, uh, of, of France find one thing, the courts of, the, uh, of, the, of the England and Wales find something else, and the courts of Angola find something completely different. Um, another aspect which is particularly important um, uh, in terms of the failings of the, of the of, of court-sponsored IP litigation is that even if the IP rights holder is successful, um, the rights holder does face considerable different uh, difficulties in terms of the enforcement of, um, of individual court determinations with respect to their IP rights. Now, uh, if the country that issued the judgment and the country recognition of sought are not parties to the what is known as the Hague Convention on Foreign Judgments in Civil and Commercial Matters, then they will not be automatically recognized in another country and the need for a, a separate hearing, uh, even with respect to the facts of the case, which is time-consuming and is expensive, and can lead to inconsistent results, is possible. 
And unfortunately, this convention with respect to the recognition of foreign awards is useless at an international level um, because it only has been uh, ratified by uh, five countries, which include Albania, Cyprus, Kuwait, uh, and the Netherlands, and Portugal. Um, so if you're, if you're conducting business outside of those uh, five countries, as uh, many individuals are, um, the convention is, is, is fairly useless. Now, of course, the EU has carved out uh, um, its own separate regime with the Brussels regime, which does allow uh, the enforcement of foreign judgments that are rendered by domestic courts, but that is only applicable to the EU. So uh, it uh, does not help much uh, outside of the European Union, um, except with respect to um, you know, Iceland, Norway, and Switzerland, which, which also are, um, are, are, are parties. Um, so uh, th this leads to considerable problems because your, your um, court determination required in the US is worthless in uh, other countries. Arbitration helps to get over this hurdle. So now, not without its own complexities, arbitration can frequently offer a better alternative um, than uh, litigation. Um, first of all, it uh, addresses a, uh, it offers a single procedure, and uh, through ADR, the parties can uh, agree to resolve a, um, in a single procedure, a dispute uh, involving intellectual property that is protected in a number of different countries, uh, thereby avoiding uh, what we, we were discussing, um, the expensive complexity of multi-jurisdictional litigation and uh, the risk of inconsistent results. Um, and they can do this simply by agreeing um, uh, with the parties involved in the dispute to resolve the multi-jurisdictional disputes in a single arbitral forum. Um, with a, par a properly drafted arbitration clause or submission agreement, uh, there are no jurisdictional issues because the agreement to arbitrate itself constitutes submission to the jurisdiction of the arbitrators. Um, so you won't have a, a plethora of jurisdictional requirements that, uh, that must be uh, looked at at a uh, domestic level, um, and which very considerably, especially among common law and civil law regimes. Um, there are also no conflict of law issues as well, which uh, can be a real headache for people uh, involved in international disputes. Um, more importantly, um, well, as importantly, in contrast to court litigation, uh, the parties themselves may select the most appropriate decision makers for their disputes. Um, so Professor Gethetti, um, for instance, could be chosen as an arbitrator um, with respect to an Egyptian um, um, trademark dispute or patent dispute rather than the Egyptian judge that recently sentenced uh, you know, hundreds of Egyptians to death which is a, a, a potentially a positive thing in, in certain uh, jurisdictions. Um, and often the jurisdiction uh, in, uh, often arbit arbitration can also offer a better, uh, I, I would say a higher quality of justice simply because we state court systems are uh, overburdened at this, this time. And uh, the parties uh, who, chosen are, who choose an arbitrator to resolve their disputes and satisfy themselves that the party, that the arbitrators have the time available to resolve the disputes in an expeditious manner. Um, in addition, with international arbitration, the parties may choose the applicable law, the place, and the language of the proceedings, which uh, have obvious um, uh, ramifications on the efficiency of uh, justice. And arbitration can, but does not always, result in, uh, in a faster process. Uh, the primary advantage of arbitration is that there is, um, in, in terms of speed, is that um, arbitration agreements, uh, arbitration awards are final and binding. Uh, there are not appeals, um, except for very limited appeals. And if the parties would like to do so, it can tailor the um, arbitration dispute process 
uh, in such a manner that it ends quite swiftly, uh, primarily uh, through using something which is called expedited arbitration. So when you are uh, you know, a client in, the, in their licensing agreement, um, you can consider adding an arbitration clause uh, calling for expedited arbitration under the whiteboard rules and this will uh, uh, ensure that the entire process only takes a few months rather than uh, quite a few years, uh, potentially. Um, arbitration can also be slow, however. Um, the average arbitration takes over a year, so uh, I, I, I would recommend uh, including expedited arbitration clauses uh, whenever, uh, when possible, um, except for the most complex disputes involving the uh, largest uh, uh, amount of damages. Um, arbitration is also a positive in terms of the enforcement of IP rights because of its neutrality. Now, ADR can be neutral to the law, the language, and the institutional culture of the parties, uh, thereby avoiding any home court advantage that one of the parties may enjoy in court-based litigation. Um, where familiarity with the applicable law and local processes can offer significant strategic advantages. Or in, in certain com uh, countries which are, um, which are uh, off the beaten path, um, where, where we've worked in the past, such as Algeria or uh, Equatorial Guinea, like you, you there, there, is, there can, or at the Ivory Coast, you can have blatant discrimination, uh, unfortunately. Um, on the part of uh, certain um, uh, judges. Are arbitrators always neutral and impartial? Um, well, they must be in international arbitration or else the award that they render can be challenged because partial, partiality is one of the few grounds on which a court can refuse to enforce an arbitral award. So while you will have the occasional um, uh, it, it's quite rare. It's quite rare that you'll find a, a non-neutral arbitrator, and, and if it does happen, their, their, their award will be largely meaningless. Uh, finally, uh, arbitration proceedings uh, are confidential uh, to a far greater extent than uh, uh, domestic court litigations, um, and this allows them to focus on the merits of this dispute without concerns about its public impact or, the, uh, or any harm to the reputation of dealing uh, with the dispute. Um, and uh, in terms of, yeah, I already mentioned the finality of the awards. There's, there's not a lengthy appeal process. So once you have your award, you, you do know what your right is. And uh, in terms of the enforceability of awards, which is a huge advantage, um, as you see, um, as you, uh, you, you saw previously, I mentioned that there were only five countries where foreign uh, uh, court awards could be enforced in other countries, meaning you have to make multiple applications with respect to the same IP rights before most uh, domestic, um, uh, domestic court, uh, the, the, the domestic courts of most countries. Whereas with the uh, New York Convention, as you can see on the map in front of you, I hope, <laughs> the map is showing, um, there are 150 countries today where uh, international arbitration awards can be enforced. So it's uh, under the New York Convention. Um, uh, the latest of which was the uh, Democratic Republic of Con Congo, um, which is actually not shown on this, this list, but uh, we'll cover a bit more of the world. But we're really getting to a point where uh, the enforcement of uh, international arbitration awards related to IP rights um, is almost at the point of, of universality, of being universal. So, well, uh, that sounds great. Uh, why isn't uh, every cross-border dispute involving IP rights uh, settled by international arbitration? Now, unfortunately, there are two major roadblocks to using international uh, arbitration with respect to IP rights. First. Uh, what I would call the hostility of states for, for encroaching on what they consider to be their territory and the notion of, of uh, what is uh, known as arbitrability has posed a question. Um, traditionally, arbitrability or the question of whether the subject matter of dispute may be resolved through arbitration uh, arose in relation to arbitration of 
of certain IP disputes. Um, now, as IP rights, such as patents, are granted by national authorities, it was argued that disputes regarding such rights must be resolved by a public body within the national system. Uh, this was the position of many state courts until, um, the, um, until the past couple of decades when things have evolved more, more swiftly in uh, common law countries, I would say, um, than in uh, civil law countries, but they, they are evolving. Um, and now the common law courts have taken the, uh, for the most part, taken the stance that any right which a party can dispose by way of a settlement should, in principle, also be capable of being settled by an arbitration, of being the subject of an arbitration, since, like settlement, arbitration is based on party agreement. Uh, so as a consequence of the uh, consensual nature of arbitration, any award rendered will be binding only on the party involved, and will not as, uh, and, and although it will not involve uh, a bind third parties, it, it will, um, it is possible under most uh, common law regimes. And uh, in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom, um, and a number of uh, African common law jurisdictions, um, the arbitration of IP issues, including, uh, including patent validity, is uh, possible, um, at least when raised defensively uh, to a claim of in infringement. However, in other countries, such as France, uh, where I am, I, I live, and uh, China, um, the, the arbitration of infringement issues is possible, but not always those of the questions of validity, which uh, uh, French courts and Chinese courts consider to be the state's prerogative. So uh, unfortunately, this, this does block some of the uh, uh, potentially blocks the, the, the usefulness of, uh, of arbitration before, um, with, with regard to claims before certain state courts. And actually this can be, uh, should also be remembered in terms of enforcement, because even if your dispute, um, for, for instance, was settled uh, in the United Kingdom by arbitration, but you needed to enforce the arbitration award in China, um, if it did concern the validity, the issue of the validity of a patent, um, it should be recalled that this could potentially pose problems. And so you might have a hard time um, obtaining compensation for the, uh, for the, um, uh, you know, for, for the award that was rendered in your favor. Um, now, there are usually ways of getting around this, but, uh, but it, it really depends. Uh, it, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, now, uh, another, the, the, the more significant uh, issue with respect to using arbitration uh, to enforce IP rights, in my opinion, is, uh, is that arbitration is necessarily based on consent. Um, it, it's, it's necessarily based on a pre-existing contractual relationship uh, between the uh, parties um, to a, a cross-border dispute, and uh, and unless you put it uh, already into your your initial licensing agreement or a franchise agreement or um, you know other IP agreement, it can be very difficult to um, to to convince uh, another party to sign an arbitration agreement once a dispute has arisen, uh, especially uh, if the other party has violated your rights and, um, and, and, and knows it, as, as is frequently the case. Um, so moreover, if the party, parties have unequal resources um, and a dispute has arisen, uh, the one with greater resources will typically find a tactical advantage in court litigation and in multiple litigations, uh, since they can outspend the, um, the smaller IP uh, right holder um, in terms of the costs of, uh, of multiple disputes spreading throughout uh, um, multiple jurisdictions, which can be enormous. Uh, so if you're taking a, taking a crack, uh, taking a swing at Google in, in 10 jurisdictions, 
Uh, you would much rather do this before an arbitration tribunal, yeah, in my opinion, but you would want to put this in your initial uh, contract with Google if you could uh, convince them to, to do this. Um, there, there are some other reasons why you would not want to use arbitration to settle civil disputes. Um, you know, unlike, well, well like, like civil law um, uh, disputes, individual disputes do not create um, uh, a binding precedent. So if your point is to, um, is to establish a principle using common law courts, um, it, 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 arbitration is, is useless. So uh, you will never have a Sony Corps versus, uh, of America versus Universal uh, City Studios um, when the Supreme Court of the U.S. ruled the making of individual copies of uh, complete television shows for the purpose of time shifting, the, the famous Betamax case, uh, does not constitute copyright infringement uh, because there is no precedent. And unless the parties have been very clear and specific uh, in their agreement to arbitrate, um, discovery will be far more limited in arbitration. Now, I personally consider that to be a good thing because uh, um, a considerable amount of uh, litigation, especially in the U.S., and a, a significant amount of litigation budget is consumed by discovery, and you will have less of that in international arbitration but if uh, it, it, you are involved in a dispute where uh, you suspect or even you're certain that uh, your opponent did something but you can't prove it, uh, obviously uh, discovery can be, uh, can be useful. Um, now you can, you can get expanded uh, uh, discovery, but it, it's the nature of arbitration that it is uh, it has a significant civil law uh, influence, and so discovery is, is, is frowned upon to a certain extent. Now, um, how do you ensure that your IPRs can be enforced by arbitration? Um, as I mentioned, um, um, you, 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 have, you should put it in your contract. You should put it in your licensing agreements, uh, especially those entering, entered into uh, by parties from different jurisdictions. Uh, you can put a clause in your patent, know-how, and trademark licenses, franchises, computer contracts, multimedia contracts, distribution contracts, joint ventures, research and development contracts, technology-sensitive employment contracts, mergers and acquisitions, sports marketing agreements, etc. Um, there are some things you have to be uh, careful about. Uh, when you are, are, are drafting arbitration clauses, which should be avoided, um, something which some companies such as Microsoft do, um, which uh, I, I think is a very bad idea, is to try to divide potential disputes uh, into non-arbitrable non IP issues, such as the validity of patents, and arbitra arbitrable commercial ones. Um, now, I, th this sounds clever uh, to do because you can avoid the issues that I, I mentioned previously with respect to states like France and, and China um, to carve out uh, uh, certain classes of IP disputes from the arbitration clause. But enforce, unfortunately, this creates a procedural nightmare um, where you have multiple uh, uh, forum selection agreements uh, and arbitration agreements uh, that determine jurisdiction, and it, it can lead to, uh, to a huge mess in terms of establishing the proper jurisdiction of the court for a case. Um, now, uh, so another issue that, uh, another thing which, uh, which in-house uh, legal counsel does uh, uh, far too often for my own personal state case is to include step clauses um, where you have multiple uh, tiers of dispute resolution. For instance, you start by uh, uh, discussing uh, a settlement. Uh, you know, it's in the contract, followed by mediation, which we are going to turn to a bit later, and uh, following, followed by arbitration for unpaid, unpaid license fees. Um, now, the problem is that each of these steps creates condition precedents um, which allows opposing counsel, the opposing party, to 
to delay the proceedings and multiply the, uh, the number of objections uh, with respect to uh, the jurisdiction of the uh, arbitration uh, tribunal um, because they, they will argue that a condition precedent has not been satisfied and that you know, the timing, uh, for instance, the three months of, uh, of dispute resolution that was provided for was not uh, in fact respected based on the wording of the closet. I, I've seen this happen dozens of times and it, it's, uh, it's best to avoid step clauses and just to, re to rely on model uh, arbitration agreements such as those uh, prepared by WIPO. Um, and, and once again, you should, uh, you should keep in mind there will be less uh, discovery. Now, you, if you want to obtain access to arbitration, uh, which can be much swifter, um, as I mentioned, which has a, a considerable number of advantages, um, you can also do so after a dispute has arisen uh, by way of a submission agreement, as it's known. Now, a submission agreement is just an arbitration agreement. The only issue with uh, using a submission agreement is that you do have to get the party to agree to sign it. And, um, uh, this can be very hard to do. Um, now, something which is a clever way of, uh, I, would, I would say, bringing in uh, arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism through the back door is, um, is in including it on, uh, on websites. <laughs> you know, pretty, pretty much anything uh, which is uh, uh, made available by the web, any type of agreement uh, which is entered into uh, by the web can be subject to, uh, to international arbitration. So if you register on a website like Spotify, um, uh, you know, streaming music, you are agreeing to, to arbitration. Uh, there was recently a bit of a scandal because uh, it's kind of funny, uh, General Mills uh, um, was, uh, was, 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 was forcing everyone to, into binding arbitration if they downloaded a coupon or subscribed to an online newsletter or entered a sweepstake um, and individuals were not aware that uh, they were entering into the rights and there were some debates about whether you clicked a like on their, on their web page, um, whether or not you were uh, entering into binding arbitration. Um, and although this can be a good thing, um, you know, if, if you are uh, uh, a, a consumer of, of, of a certain product um, and you wanted to be part of, a, part of a class action, for instance, um, going to arbitration could be, uh, um, would not be as helpful for you. Um, in terms of mediation, uh, which is the, the final topic I will be um, uh, dealing with before we discuss this uh, a bit more. Um, the truth is that uh, mediation is far more frequently used um, uh, simply because it is a swifter and, uh, and less expensive procedurally than uh, binding arbitration. Um, you can see, for instance, and uh, on the screen, uh, I hope, <laughs> if this is working, um, uh, you can see that 95% of uh, disputes, that intellectual property disputes that take place in Japan, uh, for instance, this is uh, our statistics from the uh, Japan Intellectual, Intellectual Property Arbitration Center, um, have been resolved by mediation rather than uh, arbitration. Now, mediation, uh, as, you, as you may know, uh, because it is, it is better known than arbitration, is a flexible uh, settlement technique conducted privately and, and typically confidentiality, almost always, in which a mediator acts as a neutral facilitator to help the parties try to arrive at a negotiated settlement of their dispute. Um, in essence, mediation is, is, is someone helping you to negotiate with respect to your IP rights um, because uh, you were unable to negotiate with uh, the other party. It was too difficult. And this can uh, often help and happen when there are uh, uh, highly different cultures, um, when there are different negotiation cultures involved. Like the, uh, you know, the, the French negotiation culture, for instance, is very different than the, um, I would say, than the American one, even, uh, which is far more, 
uh, direct, uh, I would say, and obviously, you know, the, uh, if you're negotiating an agreement with a Chinese company, the negotiation style can be difficult as well, and uh, uh, um, and if a dispute has arisen as well, it can be hard to find. Uh, um, it can be hard to find uh, an easy resolution to that matter without using a, mediate, a mediator who is uh, trained in in in, um, in assisting uh, with finding such a settlement. Um, but but in the end, mediation is really just uh, negotiation, seeking to find a win-win solution for both of the parties. It does involve compromise, and so. Uh, if one of the parties is, uh, if the party does not want to compromise because they consider they're 100% justified with respect to their IP right claim, um, uh, mediation might be a waste of time. And also, if the other party is in, in is acting in bad faith, it, it, it is a waste of time. I mean, the other party might uh, might attend to 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 make it look like they were participating in the process, but. Uh, um, but there's nothing you can do if, if the party does not want to, even if you've signed an agreement calling for mediation, and even if the um, uh, opposing party does attend with respect to the license agreement, there's nothing you can do to, to force them to accept the decision. Um, and the only way that mediation becomes final and binding is uh, if the parties enter into um, an agreement uh, with respect to the settlement of the dispute. And then, like any contract, it does become uh, final and binding. But you don't have the, um, but it would be enforced like any other contract, rather than relying upon the New York Convention, um, which is available in arbitration and allows you to go to 150 different companies. But at, at the same time, I, I do recommend it, because nine times out of 10, rather than going through an arbitration, which can take uh, certain companies uh, well over a year, uh, the average duration of an arbitration at the ICC is 18 months. Um, it, it is possible, to, and the average cost of an arbitration before um, the LCIA and the ICC and the ICDR uh, for large international disputes is well in excess of a million, uh, 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 a million euros. Um, so, so there are good reasons in terms of time and cost to um, to, to, to attempt mediation, even if it does not have the same binding um, uh, precedent. Um, now that and more or less ends um, what I would like to, to say about the dispute. But I, I did want to mention that, uh, first of all, mediation is typically used in conjunction with arbitration. Um, frequently, the uh, best way uh, to ensure that a party does take part in mediation is to um, is to 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 have a have a stick, and the stick is is, is basically binding arbitration. Um, and the fact that the other party does know that they will have to go to 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 arbitration, they will have to spend a year and a half settling the dispute, and they will have to spend a uh, considerable amount of money uh, defending the dispute and a lot of time and energy uh, if they're unwilling to resolve it by mediation. And, uh, and, and frequently the parties will commence an arbitration, and as you can see, uh, with respect to this uh, document concerning WIPO um, arbitration disputes. And um, they will start with arbitration, they will move to mediation. If they settle it, very well. Uh, this, the case is over, and if it doesn't settle, they go back to arbitration until the end, so that they will have resolution to their international dispute. Um, oh, and, and, and just one other thing I wanted to mention. I, I can't stress how important it is, especially for disputes which are not um, for an amount. Any dispute involving an amount that is less than, I would say, approximately uh, $100,000 I would highly recommend using uh, what is known as expedited arbitration. It's simply uh, swift arbitration. And you can see the WIPO has actually in introduced uh, arbitration rules, um, expedited arbitration rules with respect to IP rights, um, where the entire proceeding only takes two months. 
And uh, two months to resolve uh, an intellectual property related dispute is obviously um, um, of considerable interest um, uh, as compared to going before a, uh, a state court. So uh, that ends the, um, the initial uh, part of my presentation, but I did want to open the floor to uh, questions uh, that any of you might have uh, with respect to this matter. Um, let me see if I can get back on to the main presentation. But uh, I did want to open up and see, do, do you have uh, any questions uh, uh, with respect to IP-related international arbitration? What? Well, thank you very much for this presentation, William. Um, technically speaking, I have I've tried to unmute people, but I think if you want to ask, but those people who muted themselves, I cannot unmute them. So you would have to unmute ah. yourself to ask a question. I can't force people to to be unmuted. Um, in case for any reason you don't figure out how to unmute yourself, I guess you could um, just type in a question. Yes, if I can find... Uh, um, you could type in a question in the, in the slide board. Ah, okay, I've got a question. Okay, great, great, great. Just that, like, we had already one, one, we had one question that was asked uh, during your presentation. Ah. I'm sorry, I didn't know um, that, uh, Which was asked by, by, by Chuck Meyer, who said, like, uh, you may get to this, but aren't there still some jurisdictions, like Italy, that preclude arbitration of IP disputes? Yes, that was the uh, arbitrability question. And uh, as I mentioned, it, it, it's more of an issue in, uh, in civil law countries, such as uh, France, where, where I currently practice because they do consider that it is the uh, state's right to determine some of these issues. Um, usually it, it depends on what the precise claim, uh, IP claim involves. Um, if, it, if it's solely a claim relating to um, the infringement of an IP right, um, you, you usually can uh, deal with it by arbitration. Um, but, you know, once again, not a question of the validity of the IP right in countries like France, Italy, uh, China. Um, I think that Brazil uh, has taken that stance as well in terms of uh, patents, but I'd have to uh, double check about that. But that is an issue. That's the second biggest issue along with uh, consent for using uh, international arbitration uh, to resolve disputes.